a little bit the balance uh, toward the imaging part. We heard a lot about uh, uh, computing. So I will talk about computational imaging in complex media. And I will explain, of course, the title will become clear as we go to the talk uh, of with and without wave function. So I mean, uh, Laboratoire Castel-Rossel, and these are basically the four, uh, uh, the four uh, institutes with the Pondon, EMS, Economic Superior, Southern University, College de France, and CNRS. So, in a way, the goal for me would be to, in this picture, to remove the cloud and allow you to, to see clearly uh, through uh, the fog. This is very common in Paris uh, lately. Okay, so but first let me acknowledge the, the book. So we have a complex media optics lab, uh, Comedia and 3D on, on Twitter. And we are two PIs, so uh, myself and uh, Barbosa, Inton Barbosa de Aguilar, who is a young uh, CNRS researcher, mostly interested in. Raman imaging and nonlinear imaging in general. And um, we are, the, our goal, uh, the overarching goal of our team is to understand and exploit the complexity of light propagation in complex media. Of course, uh, probably many of you have met uh, Louis this year, uh, uh, that's a, a secondary PhD student. Okay, so I want to talk about imaging in a complex environment. And I want to start by this image of imaging through turbulence. So this is what happens if you, you have a jet engine that is blowing some hot air. So the, the index of refraction is in the modeleus. And when you start from a plane wave on this, as, as it propagates, it is perturbated. And when you try to focus it back to a point, you basically perturb the point of function. You, have, you don't have a sharp diffraction in this spot. You have a blur. Okay? And this blur is fluctuating. Okay? And we know there is a conventional technique to uh, address this problem, which is called adaptive optics, where you take this uh, aberrated wavefront, and in real time, you want to measure this wavefront and counteract this wavefront, compensate this wavefront with an active element. It's called the deformable mirror. And with that, you can retrieve flat wavefronts. And uh, when you do that, you have sharp images again. This is really used a lot in astronomy where you need to compensate the atmosphere. Okay? So we don't, uh, we don't want to compensate aberration. This is, uh, in a way, uh, the problem is solved. It's too easy. And we, we want to care about scattering. And scattering is illustrated in this picture, where you see, basically, uh, light coming from the sun. OK, so if you see the sun, it's sharp. It's, uh, it's blind you because there is a lot of light. So this is ballistic light that has become unperturbed from the sun to your eyes. I mean, slightly perturbed, but not too much. Then you have the, color, the blue color of the sky. The blue color of the sky is coming from the fact that light from the sun has been uh, scattered by the particle of the air and uh, to your eyes. So this otherwise would be black. So this is the single scattering, and we know it's blue because of uh, Rayleigh scattering, which scatter more the blue than the red. Okay? And the regime I'm interested in is basically multiple scattering. So this regime where lights enter here in this cloud, and it cannot penetrate because there are so many droplets that it will bounce around in the cloud uh, until at some point it will emerge uh, either on the far side or uh, back up uh, toward, the, toward, the, uh, toward the space, OK? So this is really the regime that we are interested in. And as you can see, it's very opaque. You cannot see through very easily. It's a very challenging regime. And uh, one of the reasons is I'm not just looking at the, at the sky, but for, for us, it's extremely important to see through scattering, because we are scattering. Biological tissue are in homogeneous and scattering. And this is a photo of the skin, so you can just see the surface, but it's very hard to see below, OK? And the reason is because you can define the so-called mean free pass, the scattering mean free pass, how long it takes for light to be scattered. And it's of the order of a few tens of microns. 
Okay. Of course, tissues, they, are not, you know, they don't have a high index of refraction. So light is scattered mostly forward, but after a few scattering events, it becomes completely isotropic. And this uh, the range over which it becomes very isotropic is typically a millimeter. Okay. And absorption in the visible can be uh, in first approximation neglected. I mean, it becomes important after a while, but in first approximation, you can consider that uh, we are just a frozen cloud okay, with this kind of property. Okay, so what happened when you send a coherent light in the scattering medium? And I illustrate it from this uh, nice simulation from a colleague, uh, where you have a laser, and they come, and each of these dots is a scatterer, okay? So think of it as a, as a droplet or as an atom or whatever you prefer. So the light will basically come, and whenever it hits a scatterer, it will emit a secondary wave. In this case, it's isotropic because it's very small. And you can see also some secondary wave when the first wave hits uh, uh, it's uh, uh, another atom. Okay, so that's basically uh, scattering. But what we observe here is mostly single scattering. Okay, so the the, the paradox, the complicated situation. This is actually easy to uh, to do. You can even you know uh, recover the position by analyzing the light that comes out. This is uh, this is tomography and it's, it's relatively easy or holography. Uh, but the problem is like this: come when you have this kind of situation, which is much more. Uh, which is much more complicated because in this case, the mean free pass is much shorter than the dimension of the system. So when I send uh, light into this medium, this pulse, ballistic, the ballistic part of this pulse will disappear immediately. But it's, it's gone. There is exponential attenuation. And then there is only scattered light that will basically bounce inside the medium. And it bounces for a very long time, much longer than it would take for the pulse to traverse because you have this uh, you know, recurrent uh, uh, pass inside, this kind of random walk inside. So there is no more ballistic light in this regime, this deep multiple scattering regime, as we call it. But there is very strong uh, spatial and temporal perturbation. And you can see from this uh, interference, these this, this dots that you see, that you have interference. It's basically a coherent process. So if you put a camera on the far side, what you observe is what is called a speckle pattern, which is basically a universal interference pattern when you have this order. So each grain, like this one, for instance, it's made of many paths that come to this position uh, from uh, different possible inputs. And because of the scattering process, they come with random phase. Okay? So you can understand the statistics of the intensity as a sum of random phase. So you have a, a, a universal statistic with exponential, negative exponential intensity distribution. Each grain has also a well-defined size, so it depends where you are. It depends which rays can come and form this focus. So if you're far away from the medium, it's big because the DNA is this large. If you're close, it can be extremely, extremely small because the DNA is very hard. So it's also wavelength dependent because this interference depends on how long the light stays inside. The longer it stays inside, the longer uh, the, 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 the more sensitive it is to a small change of wavelengths. So if you change the wavelengths of your laser, the speckle changes. Okay? And this, uh, this uh, speckle, the, 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 the sensitivity of the speckle, is dependent on how long the pass is. Okay? And this we heard yesterday in the uh, chaos group. So the key point is that this speckle is a complex distribution. But again, it's a coherent process. It's a linear process. And therefore, at the end of the day, everything you, we, I was showing you for uh, the basics of adaptive optics I was showing you at the beginning is also valid for this kind of, uh, of phenomenon. It's just a different scale, a different uh, regime of scattering, much more severe, but uh, the, the same tools can apply. Okay? So in imaging, we have different class of problems depending on where we want to image uh, uh, for a scattering system. So this is illustrated in this talk picture. So you have this character in the front. There is a lot of ballistic light that goes to this character and back. So um, with little attenuation. So I can see very clearly it is sharp. Okay? So this is an easy problem, a ballistic problem. It's like looking at the surface of my skin. Okay? I, have, I, I don't talk about the problem of sectioning or knowing the depths, but that's another problem. But that's relatively easy in terms of photon budget and resolution. Then you have hard problems. So you see this character a little bit at the back. I have to close the, the curtain so we see that. And uh, this is hard because I have much less photons. I have, I have exponential attenuation of this ballistic light. And I have a lot of background. So for this kind of uh, uh, problem, we have some techniques like multi-photon microscopy, confocal microscopy, optical coherence tomography that can bring some answer and select these two photons. And then you have this problem, which was considered impossible until 2007, of imaging, I will explain in a moment why, of imaging very deep inside the scattering medium. Okay? 
with only set of light. I have no ballistic light. The question is, can I still recover diffraction limited image in this question? And one uh, very illuminating answer came in 2007 with this paper uh, from uh, Velkov and Mosk in the Netherlands. And they showed that you can actually go from this situation where you have a plane wave here going to a scattering medium, in this case it's white paint, white paint pigment on the glass side, and you observe a spectrum. And what they said is, okay, let's take a detector on the far side, let's look at the intensity there, and let's optimize the wavefront of the incident light in such a way that I maximize this intensity. And they observed this extremely uh, uh, um, uh, striking result. I mean, some people at the beginning said, oh, it could work, it would be a very minor improvement. But the improvement is very drastic. You get uh, basically a very strong focus. And this focus is diffraction limited. It's basically one speckle grain that became extremely bright. Okay? And you can understand it as some kind of adaptive optics. So one way to understand it, uh, this is uh, uh, just showing you some simulation, is to say that I want to optimize this intensity in the middle. So what I'm doing, I'm playing on, the, uh, on, the, on my initial wavefront, and I can change the phase in such a way that I can constructively uh, interfere all the contribution from each pixel at this position. So this is what you see on the right. You have this, uh, this uh, phasor that slowly aligns. So let me show you that. Yeah, the movie is playing again. So you see, and, and as it aligns, the, the interference uh, 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 start not very constructively, you have a little bit of intensity but not much in general, and then you align all the phasors together and you have a huge gain. Okay? So when you do that, you get basically in this multiple scattering regime a perfect point spread function with a very high signal to noise ratio. It only depends on the number of pixels that you have. So to do that, you need to have tools, and these tools are these tools to control the wavefront. Uh, I was showing you uh, initially this deformable mirror that's for adaptive optics, so few actuators, very fast for atmospheric condition. What I was showing you before was done with a liquid crystal modulator, so it's basically phase modulator, lots of pixels, very slow. Uh, and what is, um, so this is not very good because it's too, not enough pixels, so it's typically not, not good enough for scattering. This is uh, basically the, the, the staffel tool for this kind of experiment, phase modulator, liquid crystal phase modulator. And the last class is this uh, MEMS modulator, it's fast uh, pixel, typically they are binary, so you can just turn them on and off but extremely quickly, and they are great, uh, but they need tweaking. It's not, you cannot directly apply the concept I was showing before uh, there. So a typical experimental setup, if you want to do this kind of experiment, looks like that. So this is uh, from our lab from 10 years ago. Uh, you have a laser, you shine on a wavefront modulator, then you go to a scattering sample, in this case a layer of white paint. So uh, again, something very scattering, very opaque, uh, it has to be stable. And on the far side, I put my detector, or for instance, my camera. So uh, what we did uh, back in the time, so this was back in 2010, we introduced a method which was uh, based on the so-called transmission matrix concept. So you have an array of pixels, input pixels that you can control, uh, on which you can control the amplitude, uh, the phase or the amplitude uh, of, the, of the field. Then you pass through this scattering medium. In this scattering medium, you don't know what it is, but you know it is linear. And on the far side, you have a detector. So you can detect the, the field of intensity. So in between, between the input and output field, you have a linear relation that on the pixel basis you can write as a, as a matrix. Okay? And this matrix is a transmission matrix that describes how light has been going through from one side to the, to the other. Okay? So in, in our paper, we produced a method to measure this transmission matrix. So this was a well-known object, theoretical object, but it was not an object that you could actually, uh, actually uh, play with because it, it was very hard to get this information. You cannot predict a priori for multiple spectral medium what the transmission matrix will be. So you need to measure. So the way you measure is you basically shine light on the SLN, collect light on the camera, and you basically want to send a basis of modes. So you want to send many, many patterns describing all possible inputs for a basis of all possible modes. In this case, this was the Adamar basis, which was basically zero and five phase shifts. Uh, on the SLN. So for each of these modes, you will collect light on the camera, and each, uh, for each input, I have a speckle pattern, and I need actually to measure the amplitude normally of this field, because the linearity is on the field. Okay, so I need to do some to play some tricks of digital holography to record the field. Okay? So when you do that, the third vector will give you one speckle, it will be one column of your transmission matrix. 
the second one will be the second column, and you, you iterate, and you get the transmission matrix. What I want to point out is since this first paper, we could generalize a little bit this method, actually with a lot of signal processing tools, and you don't need to send the basis and measure exactly the phase. You can actually send random patterns, you can send binary patterns, you can send, you just need to send a lot of different patterns, okay? And you don't need to measure uh, phase, you can actually play uh, with intensity uh, if you do phase as people, okay? So you can refine on that and determine the transmission matrix of your system. So once you have a transmission matrix of your, of your system where you can basically play the same trick that people were doing in optimization, you can determine what is the incident field that will give you a given output field. Okay? For instance, if I want to, to focus on this particular uh, pixel, this is my target, and I need to send as input uh, the transpose conjugate of my matrix, uh, H, that I know, H, times the target. This is equivalent to a phase conjugation operation. It's as if I had a source here that would send light back there, and I would need to uh, conjugate the phase of the light there, display on the SLM, and it would go back to my, uh, to my source. Okay, so it's a phase conjugation or so-called time reversal operation. So this is uh, some experimental result we had at the time. This is what you get with a plane wave. And as you go through the medium, you can calculate the SLM pattern here. This is coded code in phase, okay? That will get you a focus at the position that you want. And you can change without any new measurement. You can change the target. And you can focus, for instance, to one point, multiple point, project pattern, and so on. We play also with different point spread functions, etc. So this is a forward problem, a direct problem. Uh, what you can do is also do some inverse problem. So the question is, okay, uh, given uh, uh, some speckle here, uh, what was the, the, the thing that was behind, okay? So this is an inverse problem. So as we heard from uh, yesterday from uh, uh, Luc Bert's talk, uh, you need to do uh, regularization, you need to do, use it if you want priors, like compress sensing, and we did all this. And can you guess what this speckle is? Of course, it's really <laughs> so anyway, so uh, I, I just want also to mention that we heard yesterday during the talk of Wissau that there are different kinds of complex media, and for instance, a multimode fiber uh, can be considered as a linear complex medium. Uh, there is a strong mixing in uh, space and polarization when you pass through a multimode fiber. Uh, there is a finite number of volts. This is the number of uh, depends on the diameter and NA of your core. And it's also a low loss system because everything goes forward. This is important in three domains. I can't cover it today, but in telecommunication, when you need to do space division multiplexing, for instance, you want to go to larger core and you would need to take this kind of method to, to do some better communication. It's important in endoscopic imaging to really make a miniature endoscope to do some imaging for ultimate fiber. And we also use that in, in quantum optics because of the low loss nature and, and high mixing uh, nature of that. Okay, and, uh, Laurent was showing one example uh, with the core uh, device that's, uh, that we did at uh, the Okay, uh, I was showing you the monochromatic version of it, but of course, the spectral depends on the wavelength, so you can also measure the so called multi spectral transmission matrix. So you will need to measure the transmission matrix as a function of wavelengths, and when you do that, you can basically control either spectrally or temporally a broadband uh, light. So, for instance, a broadband touch. And we played with that in uh, many different contexts of uh, focusing in time, focusing in space, focusing two time, two, 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 uh, two, two wavelengths at a two given position, doing some two photon excitation, etc. And it's just unlock uh, basically the, the, the possibility to do some kind of uh, pulse shaping or you know, broadband control with this kind of technique. So not limited to one given wavelength. Okay, so the take home message uh, up to this point is that um, uh, this was really well captured in this uh, uh, viewpoint that was on, on our first paper. Um, uh, that uh, in, in, in a way, uh, what you try to do in optics in general, you try to make a perfect lens. And this perfect lens uh, will give you a nice uh, diffraction limited uh, 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 system. And you can describe it by a two by two matrix in you know, ABCD formalism with one parameter that is a focal lens and uh, you know, one one zero. So if you have now this, this cube, but you know the transmission matrix, and maybe you have an SLM or maybe computationally, you can turn this into a lens, okay? And not just a lens, I was showing you this spatial focusing, but you can actually play with any uh, degree of freedom and simulate any optical element. So you can make uh, some kind of 
uh, toolbox of a possible particle element or combination of linear elements. For instance, you can make a very high MA uh, uh, focus, so you can really hit the best microscope. You can make a polarizer or you can make an analyzer. You can make a spectral filter, you can make a pulse shaper, you can make a beam splitter cube, you can even make a circuit. So the take home message is that any linear optical element or any, any linear circuit can be emulated, uh, k that with some efficiency. So you don't get, you don't always get 100% you know, efficiency, all the contrary. This is, a, uh, this is not very energy efficient. Okay, so uh, that's for the introduction so far. And now I, I want to, you know, I want to cover a little bit what we do in the book. And we do two things uh, to, to summarize. One thing is computational limiting. So we try to use this concept in combination with computational tools to do some better imaging or better information extraction in, tissue, in, in scattering media, mostly for biology. Okay, the second one we do is all this optical computing. I will not cover it too much uh, because uh, Laurent uh, Baudet from Lycon covered it on Monday during his talk. So I will just show two, uh, I will just flash two work that we did that is uh, unrelated with Lycon. Okay, so but coming back to imaging, why is it imaging? Well, because you basically get the focus, so getting the focus is uh, the, the basics of forming an image, okay? So you can need to form a focus, and the key point, and this was shown in this paper, is the resolution is completely independent of all the optical system you have before your medium, it's only due to the, to the medium itself, okay? So the lens is irrelevant, the medium is the lens, it's the optical element. The other point that is important is you, don't, you need to focus and you need to ideally scan the focus or form multiple focus. And one way to do it well is a so-called optical memory effect. And it means that if the medium is thin or forward scattering, so if it has a little bit of, it's not you know, totally very opaque and thick, you have a little bit of correlation and you can actually scan a speckle or scan a focus. So you have some field of view over which to form an image. So with these two ingredients, you can use, uh, or even just with the first one, you can do quite a lot. But with these two ingredients, you can you can uh, you can do some uh, some kind of imaging in scattering media uh, with scatterlight. Okay, so one key point is how to go inside, because everyone I was showing you was to go through the medium. But uh, the, in practice, you know, if you have a detector, you can directly look at it. So if you, you can't put the camera inside your tissue, okay. So uh, you would like to use this technique in a non-invasive way and uh, remotely monitor or guide light inside the medium. And this uh, review from 2015 is still pretty much up to date because in the five years that followed this first work, many, many avenues have been tried and there is a so-called GuideStar catalog. GuideStar is by analogy to uh, adaptive optics, where these GuideStar are used to do adaptive optics. Um, and you, you, you can use many, many processes like two photon fluorescence, second harmonic generation, ultrasound tagging, photoacoustics, etc., etc., in order to uh, find a way to guide light inside. None of them is really a, a silver bullet to solve all the problems, but uh, they, they still provide interesting solutions. There's no clear uh, winner. Okay? So what I want to show you today is uh, yet another one, because you, one you can, you, there is one uh, contrast mechanism you don't see here, which is fluorescence, simple fluorescence. And the reason was it's because it's conventionally it was thought that it doesn't work. Uh, and let me explain you why. But first, let me tell you that why fluorescence is important, why we try to do that, even though it was supposed to be uh, difficult, because fluorescence is everywhere, and it's still uh, uh, the most used modality in, in microscopy. So it's really important to, if we can manage to do some fluorescence imaging, simple fluorescence imaging, this is cheap and this is applicable for many people. Okay, so can we detect or focus on a fluorescent object? And the answer, this is 2008, so just one year after the first paper, was yes. Okay? So what they did was they, they have a laser, they shine through a medium, and they collect the fluorescence on an on a, on a EMCCD, very sensitive CCD. And here you can see there is one fluorescent bead inside. Okay? So if there is one fluorescent bead inside, initially you just see a blob, because you, you excite it a little bit. And if you optimize, you will see much more light, okay? much more fluorescence on your detector. And since you know that there is only one, for sure you have focused, you have basically focused your, 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 your light to this beam. The problem is, what if there are uh, multiple ones, okay? So on a single one, it works. On an extended object, it's not easy, okay? So one solution that was put, that was put forward um, uh, is to use nonlinear feedback. So two photon excitation, three photon excitation, 
allows you even on an extended object to recover a single focus, uh, which, which is the basis for imaging. So this was, for instance, in these papers. Uh, the second one is, is more computational. So if you have this so-called memory effect, by analyzing this, uh, by analyzing this speckle pattern here, there are some little correlation that coming from this uh, memory effect that allows you to retrieve uh, to retrieve an object. So, for instance, if you see this blob and looking at the spatial correlation, I, I don't enter into the details here. You can basically retrieve this uh, by doing some again a phase retrieval algorithm. Uh, and again, this is inspired by astronomy. Astronomy did everything before us. Okay, so okay, so now what the, the what we ask ourselves is okay, what is the speckle of multiple incoherent sources? So, what if you have one source? If you have one source, even though it's an incoherent object, this one source will be spatially coherent if it's a small uh, spot. So, if you put a camera, if you filter spectrally so that uh, you only pick one wavelength, you will get a speckle from this single incoherent source. And the contrast of the speckle is by well it's one. So now if you have two targets, two, two targets, the speckle will diminish a little bit. If you have three targets, the speckle will diminish a little bit. The reason is that you add incoherently the speckle. So you add the intensities of the speckle and the, 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 the overall contrast of the speckle diminishes. So there is a, the, the contrast is basically known to evolve as one over square root of n. Okay? So this is how you transition from something fully coherent to something fully uh, incoherent. And this... Yes, maybe it's not important, but why is it 82% and not one of the square root of 2? Uh, okay, I, I, I thought it was one of the square root of 2. You check the number. It should be one of the square root of 2. Indeed, yes. <coughs> so I'm not sure if it's maybe it's experimental. I need to check. One of the square root of 2 is... is... Okay, so it's, it should be 70%. Uh, I, I check my numbers. Um, okay, so this diminution of the, of, the, of the contrast is actually how you go through something incoherent, and sometimes that's what you want to do. Uh, from, from our purpose, that's actually good, because it diminishes, but it diminishes very slowly. So this means that even if you have a very uh, relatively extended object, you still have a measurable contrast. Okay? And this is what we're going to use to image uh, this, uh, an extended fluorescent object with this. Okay, so the first thing I want to show you is how to extract this information without memory effect and without wave function. Okay, so the goal is to say, okay, I want to image, uh, not to image, but to extract some information. And I want to, uh, this was not mentioned today, this is far from uh, most of the people in this uh, room's uh, expertise, but there is something very important in, in neuroscience that is uh, uh, functional imaging. So you can modify genetically an animal so that whenever it's a, a neuron activates, it fluoresces. It so, for instance, this is, a, this is a, I think, a, a zebrafish, and the zebrafish is almost transparent, and you can see the, the neurons blinking. So you can see a few hundred neurons blinking and communicating by following the fluorescence. So this is a great tool to, to understand the brain, uh, and it works beautifully here because the, the sample is transparent, right? But what happens if you take uh, a mouse, for instance, a mouse brain? Then the mammal brain, any, any, any animal which is more complex than, than this, it tends to be extremely scattering. So what you can do is you can do the same trick close to the surface. So close to the surface, if you have neurons, each of these neurons will either be easily measurable, or maybe uh, you see a little bit of a blur, but you can still distinguish two neurons that are close together from, from the, the blob. The blob are in the same position. You can do a lot of other things like you know, light fields, etc. Uh, multiphoton microscopy, etc. And, and from this, you can basically retrieve the temporal activity. So you can do some uh, wide field, so called wide field functional image. The question is what happens if it's, if it's much deeper? So if it's much deeper, the neuron will basically you know, blink and fluctuate with their activity, and you will see uh, at the surface some kind of light coming out, but this light will tend to uh, fluctuate a little bit and be quite incoherent. So from my uh, previous points, uh, we thought, okay, there, there is maybe some structure, there is maybe some speckle in there that we can exploit in order to find some information, okay? So the goal is uh, we extend, we can observe, actually, this, this is experimental result, uh, on, on not on neurons, but on actually large bits, large, large fluorescent bits, where we see a low coherent speckle, which is extended and broadband, from this extended and broadband source. And the goal is to retrieve the temporal activity. But this is what we are interested in in neuroscience. We want to find which what is the activity of these neurons. 
Okay, so the key insight is information is not lost, it's just mixed. Okay? So even though the, the propagation uh, through the scattering medium should remain somehow separable. Okay? So we can formalize this uh, a video that we would record as some kind of sum on many different sources, each one of them going through a transmission matrix. You sum them in intensity because they are incoherent. There is a temporal activity for each source, and of course, some noise. Okay, so the question is how to do, to do it. So we did a proof of principle experiment where the bottom part is about creating this activity. So we put some beads here. The beads are the, this uh, 10 micron fluorescent beads, so they are very big, uh, quite the size of a neuron uh, cell body. And the light from these beads will traverse the skull, the real skull, that gave us by some collaborators, about 300 micron thick, so very opaque. And the light that goes through will, will be collected on the SCMOS scanner. And the goal would be to really record that. And in order to, mod to generate this modulation, we use uh, uh, this part of the camera, of the, of the setup, that basically send some temporal excitation that we can control. And these temporal excitation are basically mimicking activities. We, we took some traces from the, some data set from biologists. Okay? And this is what we record on the camera. So the question is how to now demix and know what comes from each, each source. Okay? And for that, uh, and, and okay, so that's no shaping, you don't know the matrix, et cetera, et cetera. You, 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 are, you have no other information. So the key insight, and this is a, I have other slides, but uh, my colleague Jacopo, Jacopo Bertolotti made some beautiful animation. So the, the key insight is the following. So you have these blinking sources, so this is just point source, so think about, think about them as, 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 as neurons. And these sources will basically fluctuate and blink. Okay, so you would see some kind of changing spectrum. And uh, the idea is that, that now, as this uh, blinking source uh, happens, you record basically a movie. Okay, so you have now recorded this, info, this uh, movie that is uh, uh, as a function of position, x, y, and, and, and time. Okay, so now you want to demix, and what we use is a so-called uh, matrix, non-negative matrix factorization. So you take this video here, so space and time, and you want to factor it into two thin matrices, where basically the dimension here is the number of the source, so you know that there is this underlying structure, and the spatial fingerprint would be on this side and the temporal activity on this side. And the important point for this algorithm to work, I mean, you could do a PCA, if you don't have any better priors, but we know that it's intensity patterns and it's, it's, it's positive activity. So, so these two matrices are positive, and this helps a lot the algorithm to converge. So in a way, you want to take this video, and I can thank uh, Jacopo for his uh, nice picture, and you want to, to factor it into a set of fingerprints from each source, time a temporal activity. Okay? And this worked actually pretty well, and this is the result. So this is, we had, we, we had 20 virtual neurons. These 20 virtual neurons were within this activity, and playing with this algorithm, we could really recover uh, quite faithfully the, the, the activity of these neurons. And you know we can verify that also the fingerprint as well correlated with the ground truth. We have the ground truth for everything. Yeah. Do you have to assume that the scattering matrix doesn't depend on time on the sub wavelength uh, scale? Yes. And for a living mouse or so, will it be yes, yes, correct? yes, absolutely. So we, we assume in this model that the the, the, the transmission matrix is, is fixed, so the fingerprint won't change. I think if they would change slowly, it would be okay. We could probably find a way to follow them with some correlation. Mm -hmm. Because two fingerprints shouldn't be correlated, so if it's, uh, if it's decorrelating, you can probably follow the decorrelation. In this case, it's, it's static. I think it would apply, for instance, in some scenario, like imaging below the skull. This is why we use the skull, because the skull is very static. Mm -hmm. uh, if you want to do it in, in, you know, in through uh, one millimeter of gray, you might run into trouble with stability. Okay, and the real next steps, and it's actually something that we do in collaboration with, uh, with colleagues in the US, is to try to go beyond to real neurons and to in vivo. What we did, and I, I don't show you today, is we can do some localization by, by looking at the correlation between the fingerprints. Yes? Can you also assume that the same of no, you don't need to do it. No, you only need to assume that each neuron or source will give you a fixed fingerprint that doesn't change over time. That is pretty simple as well. So it, it has to have a linearity and some kind of stability. But uh, I mean, the same transmission matrix, I don't know what it means. Uh, you're just interested in some column of the transmission matrix.
second one. How many, up to how many neurons can this algorithm be pushed? Okay, so that, yeah, that's a very good question. Of course, we, we, we need some parametric studies to understand how it works. So it depends on the noise. Uh, so it depends on how much you integrate. So if you give yourself an integration time, uh, it depends on how much photon you have. It depends on how many frames you take. The more frames, the better it can be in principle. Uh, it depends on how many pixels you have. So the dimension of this you know, initial matrix will help. So in, in practice, we did 20 here. In other work that I will show later on, where well, it's not neurons but sources, we went about 150. Uh, we can probably refine also refine the algorithm. It's almost uh, out of the box algorithm. We need to fine tune the algorithm at all. Okay, so now just quickly, how to do some imaging? Oops. Uh, how to do some imaging? Uh, I, I want to go back to the problem of imaging. Now I have this. Uh, I, I, I just really imaging a few of Okay, so let's take a step back. And now that we have this nice uh, matrix method to demix fluorescent sources, let's try to go back to the problem of imaging. So we we have basically a uh, light that we can control, and we have let's say we have a black box, and this black box is not a true black box. It's a black box that you can interrogate with input. You collect some output, and this black box you can basically uh, assume that it's made of uh, three parts. So you have a scattering medium that you have to cross one way in the forward direction to reach from your special light modulator to your object, okay? Then the light from this object will, be, will, will, will come back for the medium and will basically go to this outgoing transmission matrix. So if it's incoherent, this is a positive transmission matrix. Um, and, and you can collect light on the camera. So you can make a, a, an image formation model that the intensity of your camera is this uh, outgoing transmission matrix times the modulus square of E in uh, times the transmission matrix this is for fluorescence, okay? So can we do some imaging uh, with this model? And can we extract these two matrices, all non-invasively, focus on the target, and image the object? And the answer is yes. So this is the experiment we did. We shine many random patterns. For each of these random patterns, we excite this object, and we collect images from the camera, fluorescence images, low, low spectral contrast. And then the first part is really this matrix factorization part. So from this matrix factorization part, I can retrieve the pattern from each bead and the temporal activity by which they were excited. Okay? Uh, if I know how they were excited, it's as if I had a camera there. So it's, I, I basically remotely uh, determine how much light I have on each bead. So I can now do the uh, phase retrieval step in order to retrieve my, my transmission matrix because I know which pattern I sent, I know which intensity I have on each bead. So I retrieve my transmission matrix to my object. Not, of course, when there is no light, I can, no, no fluorescence, I, I, I can't say this. So if I do that, with these two steps, I have my two matrices, input and output, and then I can do some imaging. And I could show that, that we could show that the difference is focused on the target. This is simulation, but we can do it also experimentally. And also, if we have some correlation, some knowledge that there is some memory effect, some correlation between the fingerprint of two bits which are close together, what you can do is you can look at the cross correlation between two uh, fingerprints from two bits, and this will tell you their relative position. Okay, so this is what we use here, and with that you can basically do some kind of global reconstruction of the object. So in this case here, you can see some reconstruction in each side, in each, this is the, the ring is the, the memory effect range. So here you can reconstruct all the bits which are close by by looking at the correlation, and by combining all this information, you can get some kind of extended uh, view of your object, even if it's expanded beyond the, the memory. So with this, we did some uh, very simple, uh, uh, we, we went beyond bits, so the question was, okay, does it work only for this isolated point source or not? And there is, it doesn't, so you can do better. So on top, you can see some fluorescent beads that we could observe on the microscope from below. And uh, if, when we reconstruct, we, get, we can basically get the structure. So this was really our this first paper on the topic. And since then, we, we actually uh, uh, improved on that. And I just want to flash you the, the result we had in our most recent paper from the beginning of the year, where you can see really some impressive, uh, impressive improvement. I'm not sure I can, I can call the final image impressive, but impressive improvement in the reconstruction. So you can see this different uh, uh, pollen grade, or it's a cellulose fiber with uh, some, uh, basically some uh, uh, highlighter to, to make it fluorescent. And you can recover the shape pretty well. In this case, there is a nice k-batch that I don't want to get into the details. That there is no SLM anymore. So we just replace the SLM 
by your rotating diffuser to create some kind of fluctuating excitation. We don't need the SLM anymore in this nice in this experiment, which is, which is nice. Okay, so I uh, just want to uh, go back to, it's, it's machine learning, it's not just uh, computational imaging here. So I just want to go back to uh, neural networks and machine learning, and of course we, we've heard many times that neural networks just matrix multiplication. So uh, the, we, we also heard that, and that was on Monday, that the transmission matrix is basically a, a complex random matrix multiplication from input to output. And you can see that as a multiplication by a fixed and large random matrix. So you've heard, and I just want to remind you that Lighton is uh, trying to leverage that for uh, computational tools like inference, training, linear algebra, etc., uh, at relatively large scale, and you can buy it. Okay. So what I want to flash is two results that we have in the book. The first one is reservoir computing. So this is, uh, we heard about it many times, and I just want to remind you, of course, the very simple uh, formalism of fixed uh, recurrent neural network and input and output, and you only train the output. At the, at, the, at the first stage, you calculate the stage, the state of the reservoir at every iteration by doing some kind of nonlinearity f and some kind of matrix multiplication for the weights. So, where these two are basically the input weights and the, the, the reservoir weights. And in the reservoir computing, they, they can be, uh, they are typically uh, random. Okay, so what we what we what you can show is that our system is exa exactly implementing this. So on the SLM, you can code basically the input at some time and the state of the reservoir, like here. The trans the propagation for the medium will basically perform this matrix multiplication, and the intensity detection will basically perform the modulus square, the, the nonlinearity, and give you the next step of the reservoir. And then with some electronic feedback, you can go back at the input and iterate uh, uh, over uh, several iterations. And just to show you the kind of results we can do, we can do not just temporal time series, but we can do spatio-temporal time series. So this is some kind of chaotic time series, uh, spatio-temporal time, time series prediction, the kuramoto stevashinsky equation from the experts. And this is the, 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 just for the inference part, so there is a learning part before. This is the, what we try to infer. This is the prediction from our system. And you can see that we can predict uh, for some time up to a couple of Yakunov time, which is, which is, uh, which is nice. <coughs> OK, so the other thing I want to mention is also the, this is the work of, uh, uh, of Louis Lou, uh, uh, of making an Ising simulator. And the general idea, I mean, we, we've heard about an Ising simulator before. So you want to simulate an Hamiltonian with some coupling uh, between some spins. And, and typically, in some, kind, in, some, in, some, uh, in some instances, you want some really complicated and ideally all-to-all copies. Okay? So the general idea is really you can uh, stem in from some discussion with, with Claudio and a very nice discussion with, uh, with him and, and Davide, that uh, the, the system we have is basically, uh, you can understand it, you can understand the light on the camera as a transmission matrix of the input, and you can actually map this as, a, as an ising problem. So you can say that this Hamilton, this, this coupling coefficients here, this, this would be my spins, and the coupling coefficients, if I look at the intensity on my camera, are linked to the transmission matrix coefficients, okay? So in a way, you can understand that uh, focusing to, to a, a point, the experiment I was showing you before, uh, initially, if you know the transmission matrix, focusing on the point with this uh, changing uh, the, the state of the input pixel, is like minimizing the Hamiltonian corresponding to, uh, to, this, uh, to this formula. Okay? Uh, and just to, we can play also with some parameters. And for instance, we could define some kind of uh, initial state, and you can basically, some magnetization state, and, and, and show that uh, you, know, you, you can basically uh, retrieve the, the good magnetization state. Of the Okay, so that's, uh, that's all the parentheses about imaging. I have 10 minutes now, to, but it, it will be, should be relatively quick. Uh, about, okay, neural networks for imaging post scattering media. And this is just a slide to show you a little bit uh, what other people have been doing. Uh, so people have been trying for a long time, I think for quite a few, four or five years now, to use neural networks to model or retrieve transmission matrix. So you basically send pattern at the input, you detect pattern on the camera. So it's, uh, quite, uh, it's quite tempting to uh, put them into a neural network and try to basically learn uh, the output pattern from the input, so try to determine the transmission matrix. So in this work, for instance, we did with, with this uh, convolutional neural network, 
which was nice, it was working. It was not generalizing very well because actually a CNN is not a very good idea to uh, basically model a system that is, you know, uh, uh, random and, and with complex coefficients. So there, there's no, there's really no convolution taking place in general. So in, in this other work that uh, was uh, shortly after, they, they were trying to do the, to determine the transmission matrix of a multiple fiber using a neural network, but they, they were a bit smarter. It was a nice improvement over this first paper, where they use a, a one-layer neural network with complex coefficients. So in this way, you basically try directly to learn the transmission matrix uh, with the right, uh, basically with the right architecture. Okay, and this worked better and could generalize and so on. So it's nice, but it, this is only to see through the scattering medium. So what we wanted to do was to uh, generalize this idea and try to apply it to our problem, which was to see inside. So what did we do? We introduced the so-called physics-based uh, two-layer neural network, where basically uh, you, you take this experimental system that I was showing you before. So we shine light, we have an object, and we collect light on the camera, and you can basically unfold it. Okay. So uh, following the, the flow of light, this is the pattern. You illuminate your object. And then you go back to your medium again, actually it's a different wavelength, so it's as if it was a different medium, and you go to your camera, okay? And now you can basically say, okay, this is just a two-layer neural network where basically my first layer goes from uh, my SLN to my object. My object is basically my hidden layer, and from my object to my camera, this is my second layer, okay? Uh, the, the, the point is you can now choose the, the, the coefficients here, the architecture, the nonlinearity here or here, in such a way that you mimic, that you model your physical system, the physical system, the physical way the image are formed. Okay? And the general idea is that by training the network on a set of input output, you will determine the TM and the objects. Okay, so the goal is not to do some inference, it's just to basically train the network. The training is the result. Okay? Uh, so this is some simulation to show that it, uh, it basically uh, works. Uh, it's not an archive, it's, in, it's actually a fixed express, it's a couple of weeks, I, I forgot to update the, 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 the reference, but you can see that the loss function can go down with, with, uh, after a, a certain uh, number of training, and you can really predict uh, quite well this, uh, this image. So that I'm, I'm not going into the details. So in this case, it's fluorescent, so the nonlinearity in the middle is a modulus squared, and there is no nonlinearity at the end because you're just adding intensity images. Okay? Uh, so this is just to show you that we, we, we can, at least in simulation, recover uh, well our transmission matrix. And we did some simple experiments, it's actually not uh, extraordinary, it doesn't work much better than the previous one, but we can refocus and, and, image, uh, and image the object. Uh, uh, this is our bit, this is just bit, no, no, uh, not too complicated, through, through the system. Okay? Uh, the, a, a very big point, which is important, LMF is very specific to fluorescence, to incoherent processes, but this method is generalizable. Okay? So even second harmonic generation, for instance, if you want to do some more this, this technique, you just need to change the, the, the parameter, the nonlinearities of your networks. Uh, and in this case, LMF wouldn't work, so you just need to change the nonlinearity. Uh, then, the, the, for instance, this is not the modulus square, this is the parenthesis square in this case for, for that SHG, there's no, it's because it's coherent, and, there, and, and then you have a, a coherent addition in your camera, so the last layer is a modulus square. So just by changing this, you should be able to change modality, and again, at least only in simulation, we show that it should work. And I just want to point out that this should be general, generalizable to a lot of coherent or incoherent process with different order of nonlinearities, just by playing on that. Okay. And you can, of course, add a lot of priors also on the propagation. So if you have some memory effect, if you have some multi-layer uh, networks, you can have multiple linear layers to simulate your medium. You can have some priors on the, on the object and so on and so forth. So you can refine a lot, and, uh, but at least the concept, I think, is, is, is very powerful and, and very generalizable. Okay, I'm at the end of my talk. I try to convince you that uh, tissues are complex and imaging tissue is challenging but this complexity can be exploited. So shaking can undo scattering for this, for this first part, this you know, uh, um, uh, basic concept that has been developed for 10 years of optimization, transmission matrix, you can do also optical phase conjugation, but it's not always needed. So I was trying to convince you that computational tool can help us a lot. So 
incoherent light is possible, and this was a, 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 a thanks to the, the power of non-negative matrix factorization. That was a huge and very, very successful tool for us to use. Uh, I'm quite surprised that it was working so well. And of course, machine learning and neural networks uh, can also come to the rescue. There are many challenges left, so we are still making very, very rudimentary images in very, very uh, proof of principle scenario. So to go inside, uh, you need to really work on different feedbacks, you need to still to work on the, on the signal, the, on the algorithm. Everything has to be, of course, with the, the, I'm supposing the medium is fixed, so if the medium is moving, it's very challenging. Uh, so it's still not yet in every microscopy labs, but uh, what I'd like to say is, if you really want to work with an image when there is no ballistic light, that there's probably no other alternative than to explore this technique and refine this technique. And with that, I, uh, I want to again to thank all my uh, co workers and collaborators on this box and, and you for your attention. Thank you very much. Simulator. So we have just a way to calculate very quickly the energy of the Hamiltonian. Okay? Yes. So you can apply any algorithm you want to find the ground state. So in this case, we're using a stupid uh, iterative algorithm to, to, to play on the, on the speed values to, to, to increase intensity and to decrease the energy. But if you have a better one, it's absolutely agnostic to the way you optimize the energy. So the, the optimization of the energy is. Yeah, yeah, exactly. So we see the field, we, we try, yes, yes. Uh, on the topic of uh, changing uh, transmission matrices, uh, the algorithm you mentioned based on non-negative matrix factorization, where you try to get the temporal uh, profile, in some sense, I feel like that one is uh, maybe the way to start addressing the changing transmission matrices, because you have, in fact, evolution of this mixing that do you look into this possibility where you have a dynamic slow, at least slowly changing? Yeah, we, we didn't look at that. So we, we know it could be done. We, first, we have a bit, we have a bit, a bit lousy at this high and a bit lousy in every you know, machine learning part. The students are much better than I am. So we are trying to look into ways to improve upon that. At the moment, what we try to do is not really to address this problem of uh, changing medium. That's too hard, what we try to do is introduce some priors on the fingerprints. Because in a way, at the moment, we try to find the fingerprints, but we don't assume anything about the fingerprints. And the fingerprints, they, you know, they look like speckles, they should be correlated to each other if they are close, so th there is a lot of priors we can put there. You can also put some priors on the temporal activity, like in spikes, or it, it spikes its functional activity. If it's uh, imaging and you illuminate them with speckle, you know the intensity is also a speckle in time, okay, as you, as you, as you change the illumination. So there are many, many priors you can put, and we want to start by that. The, the changing medium is uh, a bit beyond our expertise at the moment, but uh, we are very open to discuss it. We'd love to improve that. That's uh, probably super important for application. I mean, also the noise, right? So if you work in a low noise scenario, we are at the moment, we, we, we manage to characterize how much light we have compared to real neurons. Uh, we have about 10 times more light, so it's Roughly the same ballpark, but it's still, uh, and, and we are the limit of the sensitivity of the camera. So getting to image neuron adepts, real neuron adepts, will be challenging. Because the priors will help me with that. Absolutely, that's, that's our hope, yes. So, so the white paint is at first very easy because we are not fabrication people. So it's you know uh, you, you you put a drop of paint to wait for it to dry. So it doesn't get much easier than that. I mean there are a lot of refinements. Uh, I think Romolo can uh, talk about that. So you know making good sample, but uh, simply uh, you know just drying a, a droplet is, is is already giving you a nice sample. So that's there is an easy part to that. Okay, multi mode fiber is good. I think it depends what you want to do. Uh, for endoscopy, we also try to work now with multi 
not fibromal. You know, there is some groups like Thomas Kismar and the Indian artists doing a lot of work on this. Uh, I think it really depends on your application, but it's very nice that this concept can translate uh, almost uh, perfectly from scattering media to multiple fiber. So, what, what, or do you have in mind something specific? Or? Um, I, I was just surprised what terms of this memory effect you can control that. It's a of control of the artists. Yeah. Yeah, so, okay, so that's a, okay, that's a good question. So, the, in order to control the multi the, the memory effect is actually very weak in, in pain. It's not the best method, the best system to have memory effect. In tissue, which are forward scattering, there is actually uh, some uh, memory effect that you can use for imaging. White paint is definitely not good for memory effect, except if it's very thin, because it depends on the thickness, actually, not the multi uh, Multi-mod fiber, uh, they, they are very long, so they don't have this translational memory effect. Uh, they have other memory effect, other correlation uh, that come from the mod structure. So they, they have some kind of rotational memory effect. For instance, they have, uh, so they, they, a few people have tried to ex extract some, some interesting correlation that you could use for imaging in ultimate fiber. But it's not the simple memory effect that I was showing here. Is any simple estimate uh, in, when you use adaptive shaping yes. to increase power or Yes. Um, of amplitude of the image. Is any simple estimate how much you can increase it from, let's say, average level? Yes, yes. So some people would see this as a good example of raw wave, especially because it's a very, very rare fluctuation which you create to yes. have high amplitude at the target. So yeah, so I, I think in the context of kind of linear raw wave, it, yeah. it would be probably related. So, um, so th there is a very simple argument actually, so, yeah, that you can take from, so, from random work. Okay? So let, let me start from the, the, the sorry, let, let me start from the, from the basics. So if you would uh, measure every single mode, if you have a perfect SLM collecting everything and conjugating everything, you would get you should get 100 percent of your energy in your focus. And this has been done for instance in, in, in closed cavities and in acoustics. You get almost 100 percent in fibers, you can get close to 100%. In scattering media, typically you have millions of modes. And you have an SLM with a finite NA and a finite number of pixels. You, you, don't, you can't wait to train all these millions of pixels. So typically you would have, let's say, 1,000 pixels. Okay, so if you have 1,000 pixels, what can you get? You don't get 100% of the energy there, but you can say that all these pixels are basically independent uh, phasors that you can uh, co-phase at this position. So there is a simple way to understand what happens if you add n phasors randomly. It's like making a random walk n steps. So you go square root of n from the origin and average random walks. There is n steps. If you now add n, if you now make, make n steps not randomly but directionally, you go n step, you go distance n from the origin. Okay? So in phase space, you go from square root of n to n. But in intensity, you go from n to n squared. And with this simple uh, uh, argument, you, 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 you get roughly the, the right estimate that with n pixels, you get a factor n of intensity enhancement at this position compared to the background, which is very good because if you have a thousand pixels, you have basically a SNR of 1,000. So you're basically on a camera with you know, 8 bits or 10 bits. You don't see your background at all. But in terms of energy, there is still a lot of light everywhere. Yeah. And, when you do imaging, it, it helps you. You spend this time is accumulated. So this is like your point for abstraction. Yes. It's nice big, yes. but a lot of energy in the pebble yes. when you convert it for imaging, it destroys you. Unless you get this part, yes. It can be an interesting application for Korean combining. Uh, think about uh, if you put instead of pixels, uh, say simple lasers, and then you have yeah. a scattering medium yeah. which will prevent uh, destruction, but it will be focused in certain place to multiply. So it is very yeah, different yeah, approach to the year Absolutely, and I, I must uh, also say that uh, all these coherent combiner for, for lasers or for fibers are at least on a few modes, on, or, or you know, multi core fibers uh, have been proposed and demonstrated in lasers and passive uh, things. Uh, but you should that in that way, uh, even before that, even before this, this kind of work. 
Okay, I will uh, take the word because I'm the chairman, so I give it to myself. Uh, so I would like to, so you always speak, uh, you and who cow about linear transmission matrix. And uh, so I uh, repeat the same question. What happens when, uh, like, multi-mode fiber, you have uh, for a mixing energy exchange between the modes, so it becomes non-linear? And I make reference to recent uh, uh, work at EPFL by Dimitri Psoltis and co-workers. And so they claim, so they use the multi-mode fibers for image recognition. It's an optical processor. And they say that it works much better in the non-linear regime. So how, how come? I mean, still is not so clear. Yeah, so I would say better, not, better, not, that, not much better, but yeah, they see an improvement. So they want to use this multi-mode fiber as a neural network. But now, instead of saying, OK, the multi-mode fiber is a neural network where it's linear, and the non-linearity is the camera, the, non the fiber has some non-linearity. Okay, so the mapping now is, is, is more complicated than just a linear mapping. Okay. And, and they show that, at least in their case, they, it improves uh, a little bit the inference performances. Only a little uh, bit, not well, I mean, a little bit. It, no, it, it, it improves the bit. Okay. It's, not, it's not a dramatic improvement, but it's an improvement. And I think that's a very good uh, pass, in the, a very good uh, step in the good direction of trying to uh, exploit optical nonlinearities. In this case, very low power, so this was interesting from this perspective to do some, some inference going beyond the fact that you know, most optical neural networks are, are a single layer, unless you have some kind of electric, some electro, electro, electronic tool. So yeah, this is a very good uh, pass in the same direction. So besides uh, machine learning in this work, there are quite a few work about doing some shaping through multi-mode fiber with some nonlinearity. So there is a work by Raphael Pistoun where he was trying to control the Raman spectrum by shaping. In this case, it's not a linear relation. You don't have a transmission matrix. You can still do shaping, but you, you have to do some learning or genetic algorithm in order to find a solution. There's no uh, simple way to, to, to measure it. I think it would be interesting from an information theory perspective to study. Yes, yes. There is a theory in Pierre Lennon. About what? Uh, about the Stoltis experiment? Okay. 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 So decided that since okay. ever, me too. I got aware of that. <laughs> Nobody reads here anymore. <laughs> nature. Well, that's a bad start. People should read it. Great follow-up question on that. Now, Russell, the great moment of the the text. But uh, would it be interesting to simply experiment with the pressure on the air dynamics for processing? It would be absolutely very interesting to exploit other nonlinearities. I think the, 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 the point of this approach is that it's very simple. Uh, you, you know, it's also you know, wavelength agnostic. Uh, it's, uh, you don't require high power. So I think if you, if you want to do optical nonlinearity on the way when the propagation, uh, you enter into a lot of issues like that. So, which is very challenging. I think it's, it, it has to be done somehow, uh, probably in a smart way. So this is why this approach by uh, David Fitzatis and Fritz Moser is nice, because they really did the nonlinearity in the fiber due to the, propag to the long propagation lengths, which means it's very low power, which was nice. But, but I'm wondering how important is it? Because the linear operation is involved with the computational power. Uh, yes, but if you want uh, generalization, you need multiple layers, right? So there is only so much you can do with a single layer. Otherwise, you can you can do, you can do, use multiple layers uh, sequentially. But you know, you record, you send it back at the input. There's many work to do that. But then you have a, a, you know you have this uh, uh, decoding and coding that you need to do at every step. It slows you down. It's a big energy cost, etc. So there would be a huge uh, interest, I think, in, in, in making uh, a fully optical uh, nonlinear uh, mapping. I think th thank you so much for your beautiful presentation. The next uh, speaker is online. I'm not sure how to, to pass. Ah, uh, so, yeah, it's over there. Yes, you should be able to share. Ah, so you yeah. okay. Hello. Hi, um, let me share. So, uh, last speaker, I believe, at the school is uh, Florian uh, Marquardt from Max Planck Institute. 
uh, for the science of light in Erlangen, and uh, he's going to speak uh, about the physics for AI. Please. Thank you very much. I hope you can all hear me all right. Yes, very well. Um, can you also see my pointer moving around? Yes, I think so. Okay, very good. Let's get started. Um, so I would really have liked to be there in Como with you at the nice conference location. I have been able to follow some of the talks. Unfortunately, here I'm stuck at a hotel room in Florence. So you have to bear with me. Uh, I will be talking about a topic that is connected to some of what has been discussed at this conference already, for example, in the talk by Wolfram Pernice and also in Sylvain's talk briefly, namely how to use physics for purposes of machine learning, for purposes of artificial intelligence. And so I phrase the title in a very general fashion, how to turn almost arbitrary physical system into a self-learning machine but as you will see in the following, the most promising types of systems will be nonlinear photonic systems. And so this is work that was done with my very talented PhD student, uh, Victor. Now, before I really get started, I want to give you a little bit of an overview of what uh, we are doing in my group in terms of machine learning for physics. Um, one of the topics we are very much interested in is machine learning applied to quantum technologies. So what you're looking at here is a quantum circuit that is a sequence of gates, uh, controlled knots and single qubit gates and measurements um, for the purpose of uh, performing some quantum error correction algorithm. But this algorithm was not written down by hand or translated from some textbook prescription, but rather it was discovered from scratch by a computer using a machine learning technique, the so-called re deep reinforcement learning. So if you're interested in that kind of game, then uh, I refer to you to the references shown here. So that would be machine learning for quantum technology. Uh, there's also machine learning for photonic systems, which is very close, of course, to the topic of the school. and. Um, I could have talked about this, but I uh, think I want to spend my time on the uh, other direction, on uh, physics being used for AI. But just very briefly, here's uh, one of the things that we did in this direction. Uh, if you have uh, the geometry of a photonic crystal, you want to predict the band structure. You heard Marin talk about this kind of uh, task. And what we introduced there was to have uh, not a direct prediction mapping geometry to band structure, but rather to go via a tight binding model. So a neural network is asked rather to invent a compact uh, description in the form of a tight binding model that then can be used to uh, evaluate the band structure. And this works uh, very well, works very efficiently for training. And then afterwards it can be used to predict uh, band structures and also their topological properties and even optimize these topological band structures. So again, I invite you to have a look at this paper if you're interested in this kind of topic. Then zooming out more generally, uh, we are interested in how can we use methods of machine learning and artificial intelligence to mimic the scientific discovery process. And that of course has many parts and pieces. Uh, you have to come up with hypotheses. But before that, you will even have to decide what are the most important quantities to look at in any given mm -hmm. physical system. And so here's an example of what we did, namely give me an arbitrary physical system uh, where I really don't know what is the meaning of, say, the coordinates that I'm looking at. And you want to discover the most important quantities that tell you the most, uh, the most information about the system. And so that goes under the heading of discovery of collective coordinates and physical systems. So again, I invite you to have a look. And then finally, moving to this talk, um, how can we use physical systems to help us with machine learning? And uh, what I'm showing here is supposed to represent nonlinear wave propagation, because as we will see, uh, nonlinear waves would be a prime candidate for implementing a physical system that helps us for machine learning. Okay, 
So let's get started. And uh, you may have listened to similar introductions uh, before, um, but uh, anyway, um, artificial neural networks have a long history, of course, um, that dates back uh, more than 50 years by now. What you're looking at here is a picture of a so-called perceptron invented by Rosenblatt, which um, was already the first artificial neural network, and it was already uh, being implemented in hardware. Uh, this is shown in the picture down here with uh, all kinds of electrical wires connecting different neurons already for the purpose of image uh, processing. Now, uh, what was lacking at the time was still an efficient algorithm to train this kind of artificial neural network. And that will also be the spirit of the talk that I'm giving today. Since about uh, 10 years, there has been a true revolution uh, that you are all aware of in the field of neural networks and so-called deep learning, that is the application of neural networks with many layers. It basically started in 2012 when neural networks for the first time were winning a very important competition in the field of computer science, the so-called image, image recognition competition. And since then neural networks have always outperformed all other approaches and by now have superhuman performance in recognizing images. But it didn't stop there. A few years later, it was demonstrated that uh, neural networks and a particular technique of training them can give us also superhuman performance in very complex games such as Go, uh, which were thought to be much too complex to be solved by a computer um, reliably for the foreseeable future. And then it went very quickly. For example, nowadays, there are these huge language models that can invent stories that can write text and fake text that almost looks like as if it were written by a human. And it doesn't stop there. You can uh, not only write text and recognize images, you can also turn text descriptions into images. So this is the famous DALI, um, a platform that probably several of you have already a scene where you give a description like a tapir made of accordion, and then it tries out uh, different images that the artificial intelligence system invents on its own. Now, all of this performance, all of this impressive performance comes at a price. And the price is the sheer effort required to set up and train these systems. And that can be seen, for example, and the number of trainable parameters that these neural networks contain. So that is shown here, evolving over time, back in 2012, when uh, a neural network was winning this image recognition competition, we were still talking about um, millions of parameters inside such a neural network. And by now, these are uh, hundreds of billions of parameters. And that uh, immediately raises the question, can we build better hardware? Can we build better hardware to make this more energy efficient? That would be very important also to make it faster, maybe to do computations in parallel. And in order to build better hardware, let's not just think of uh, coming up with say, um, better platforms like moving from CPU to GPU and then from GPU to TPU and so on. This is all still in the same domain of um, digital semiconductor physics, but can we as physicists invent hardware that um, maybe uses completely different concepts and maybe also exploits the fact that uh, usually when you evaluate neural networks, you do not need the ultimate precision. So you can very well do with a little bit of fuzziness, a little bit of uncertainty. And so that all leads us to the topic of neuromorphic, that is brain inspired computing. Can we be better than the current digital solutions? Okay, so that brings me to the actual outline of my talk. I first want to give you a little bit of overview of neuromorphic computing. Where do we stand? What are the different platforms and attempts that people are making? What is missing? And then I will tell you on a more general conceptual level what I understand by physical self-learning machines. And then the question will arise how to train these machines in a completely physical way that is 
merely by physical dynamics. And that leads us to the new concept that I want to introduce to you in this talk that is called Hamiltonian echo backpropagation, which is a completely general scheme, um, completely general scheme uh, for training uh, in this physics context. And then finally, I wrap up with a few uh, first numerical experiments and a discussion of potential physics platforms, which prominently includes, of course, photonic systems. Okay, so let's get started. That's the question we want to ask. Can physics help build efficient alternatives to digital artificial networks? And people have started trying to give answers, positive answers to this question. Here you see a whole array of different potential solutions, first attempts to make this happen in different physical systems. I ordered this, the first row deals with solid state solutions, the second row deals with photonic solutions. So if I start here, up here, this is a crossbar array of memristors that is uh, resistances that have a memory. And that is of course important because uh, once you train a neural network, the idea is that you keep some memory of what you have learned during training from all the training examples that you're looking at. So you need some kind of memory element in here. It's a resistor that remembers its state. So these would be memristors. Then moving on, there are attempts to use uh, spin physics. In this case, spintronic oscillators. So you pass a current, you get uh, some oscillations of the magnetization. Then you can couple several of these and get some nonlinear information processing and use that uh, potentially to do um, something similar to what happens in neural networks. Then uh, to the right of that here, I depict um, Josephson junction physics. So you take superconducting circuits, you have Josephson junctions that uh, are a nonlinear element, a nonlinear processing element and dissipation free in principle. And in order to have some kind of memory inside these elements, uh, people took magnetic Josephson junctions, so they would have spins embedded and depending on the magnetization pattern, the properties of the Josephson junction change. So these are all solid state attempts to go beyond uh, current digital artificial neural networks. And then in the lower row, uh, we are going into optics. So first picture is uh, from the previous, uh, from one of the previous speakers works. So you can have wave propagation in complex media and as he pointed out uh, that already gives you um, basically multiplication by a random matrix. And then if you're smart, you can use that uh, for information processing. You can also be more deliberate and engineer the photonic transmission, for example, by building an interferometer network on the chip and then a photonics platform. And then you need ways to tune the individual, um, say beam splitters in this interferometer network. Uh, for example, by heating or by other smart means in principle electronically as well. Um, and then to the right of that is a picture taken from one of the works of uh, Wolfram's group uh, where uh, the idea is that you uh, have uh, phase change materials that, all, that serve the same role as the memristors. So they have can keep some memory of what went on before and they can be used to embed um, uh, tunable weights. Now for all of these, however, there is one overriding interesting question and that is how to train them, how to train them most efficiently. There are ways, um, but uh, if you want to train them fully physically, that is still an open question as I will argue and I, I will come to a possible solution in the following. Now this is all from the field of say, um, hard physics, um, we can also find first, attempt, first attempts at neuromorphic computing more from the domain of um, statistical physics or soft materials. Uh, people are talking about learning to fold or building mechanical networks whose structure they can change so that they can produce the right uh, mapping between some input and some output or build resistor networks. So people have become quite creative. But again, always the question is, how would you efficiently train such systems? Okay, so that's the challenge. The challenge is to learn, the challenge is to train. 
And so in order to make the discussion really general, I want to start by laying out what I would call a physical learning machine. So simply put, this is some arbitrary device inside which you will have some nonlinear physical dynamics and you have some way to feed in some input and receive some output. So in, for concreteness, you can imagine that the input consists in some say wave packet, radio waves or uh, other electromagnetic waves that you send in. The output uh, likewise consists of such waves, but internally anything can happen. So maybe you have a nonlinear electrical circuit, maybe you have even some mechanical elements or you have some nonlinear optics, uh, which, was, uh, which would be a more realistic uh, setup. Okay, so that's a learning uh, machine, but only if you have something that can be learned, that can be trained. So uh, on a more conceptual level, in the following, I will distinguish between the signal degrees of freedom. I always call them psi. So that is the signal that gets processed going from input to output. The, uh, that's the mapping you want to implement on the signal field psi. But it will be influenced, the signal processing will be influenced by some learnable, learnable parameters. And these parameters I will call um, theta uh, in the spirit of learnable parameters the notation that people use for artificial neural networks where the many weights inside a neural network are also usually called theta. Okay, so if that is true, then the question um, becomes how to find the right theta, how to find the right configuration of these learnable parameters to get the desired input-output relation. Now, there is one generic scheme that in principle always works. And that is to look at the output to decide whether it is the output you want. Probably it's not at first attempt. And then uh, to slightly tweak the learnable parameters and to see whether the output moves a little bit closer into the direction that you wanted it to be. So it's a kind of feedback loop. And in this way, you could adapt more and more as time goes on the learnable parameters in order to get closer to the desired output. The problem with that is it's woefully inefficient. And in order to understand why it is so inefficient, it's good to go back to artificial neural networks. So an artificial neural network, um, which was shown so many times here at this workshop, as you know, um, consists of layers of neurons. Um, there's an input layer, several hidden layers, and an output layer. Um, the information processing happens layer by layer by a combination of linear and nonlinear steps. And it is trainable in the sense that the connection strengths between the layers, they can be changed. So these connection weights can be changed and they will affect the outcome of the calculation. So now if um, you want to figure out how to change these weights in order to get closer to the desired input output relation, what you could always do is you tentatively change one of those weights. And then you see what consequences this has for, for the downstream and the computation. So because this weight has been changed, also the value of this particular neuron will now change. And as a consequence, also the values of these two output neurons will change. And then you can go and compare this against the desired output and see whether you got closer. And you would have to redo this for any possible connection weight in the network. And there may be thousands or even millions of those so for each of these, you would have to re-evaluate the output of the network in order to see what happens. So that's the so-called parameter shift method. It's always possible, but it's extremely inefficient because the total effort scales with the number of parameters. You need as many evaluations as the number of parameters in order to update all of them. So that's why people don't actually do this anymore. What is much smarter is to look at the output and to see what's the gradient of the output neuron value with respect to these connection weights. And when you go about calculating the gradient, you apply the chain rule of differentiation and it teaches you just by pure mathematics to walk backwards through the neural network coming from output going back to input. And the amazing thing is that in a single backward pass, you are able to calculate all the gradients that you need for the price 
that is just as large as a single evaluation of the network, a single forward pass through the network. So that is the famous back propagation algorithm, which is extremely efficient and it's at the heart of all the deep learning revolution. If, it, if we didn't have this algorithm, then none of what we have seen uh, in the introduction, for example, would work nowadays. Okay, so that's back propagation. Now, if we come back to our physical self-learning machine, it has of course the nice feature that uh, the information processing is purely by physical dynamics, or at least that's the idea behind it. And so what you would want ideally is that even the training can be performed purely by physical dynamics, not using any of this feedback or parameter shift method that is inefficient, but using some version of physical backpropagation. And even more than that, not only do you want to get the correct gradients in a physical way by physical dynamics, but you also want to make sure that these gradients that you got that teach you in which direction to move the parameters will be, so to speak, applied automatically to update the parameters, not by you coming in and modifying some of the parameters, but again, by some physical process. So that is at least the goal that I want to uh, explore in this talk. Everything completely done by physical dynamics. Okay, so to explain why that is difficult. Um, I want to make a contrast between the math more mathematical world that backpropagation is a part of and the biological world. So on the mathematics side, all we're trying to do really is optimization because we have something that is called a cost function that measures the deviation between the desired output and the true output that you currently get. And then you want to minimize this cost function and the way to typically to be uh, doing this would be gradient descent. So always trying to move down the gradient of the cost function until you hit the minimum, hopefully even the global minimum. So these are optimization based rules and back propagation is the efficient way, the most efficient way to calculate the gradient that you need to uh, implement this rule. Uh, the problem with that is um, it's purely a mathematical algorithm. It's not at all obvious how this, for example, could be implemented easily physically in a physical system or biologically in a biological system. What happens in a biological system is, as far as we know, completely different. So uh, here you have my sketch of a neuron uh, with electrical pulses um, incoming and an electrical pulse outgoing if... Uh, the total signal surpasses some threshold. And so the way that uh, neurons seem to learn is that uh, if they fire, then they also start to change their connection strengths. Uh, that is summarized in this uh, short sentence, neurons that fire together, wire together. So if uh, two incoming connections led to uh, surpassing the threshold and firing, then um, these connections will be strengthened. Now, this is a purely local rule. This is a purely local update rule. But then again, on the other hand, unfortunately, it's not in any obvious way connected to some optimization or to calculating the gradient of anything. It's just a purely local rule and you have to empirically find out what this rule would mean. So uh, to, to lay down the more general picture, on the right hand side, is the large area of optimization approaches that is used for standard artificial neural networks. On the left-hand side, there would be the local update rules. So the rules that we believe uh, should apply to biological systems, um, which have names like spike time dependent plasticity, where even the precise uh, timing of spikes is important. Um, and then there's a small piece of intersection, a small sliver of intersection between the two that will be important for us because we want to go for optimization because we then know on a very principled way what happens there, that we have some cost function that we try to minimize, that we're moving in the right direction. So that is nice to know. On the other hand, uh, for having any chance of implementing anything in a physical system by physical dynamics, physics is local, so we also want to have a local update rule. We want to have both at the same time. So there were very early ideas in this direction, so-called Hopfield energy models and something that I will be talking about 
um, in a bit. Um, but what we want um, for sure is this physical version of backpropagation in any manner that we can get it and a physical parameter update by purely physical dynamics. And if we have all of that together, then we would call this a physical self-learning machine, which works completely autonomously. So that's the idea. Okay, so uh, just briefly, I want to talk about the one single prior attempt that I know of at a scheme that at least um, implements a uh, kind of physical way at back propagation or an analog to back propagation in a physical manner. It will not be what I will be suggesting that uh, belongs in a completely different ballpark, uh, but uh, this is, so to speak, the one um, previous attempt. It's called equilibrium propagation. Uh, it's not very old, actually. So Benjo is, of course, one of the uh, great experts in uh, machine learning. And so it's best explained if you imagine a spin network where you have a few input, um, where you assign a few spins as input, assign a few spins as output, um, where you would fix the input and then wait for it to thermalize, go to its ground state, for example, and read off the spin directions for the output. So that's the information processing. And now if you want to train things because the output is not quite the desired output, then what um, they proposed is to apply small magnetic fields to the output in order to nudge it into the right direction, to equilibrate everything again, and then to compare the two configurations and to um, observe the change of spin correlators and to update the couplings according to this change of spin correlators. So this is still something where you have to go in, you have to measure the change of the spin correlators and you have to tune up these um, uh, couplings between the spins and the manner that is indicated by these spin correlators. But at least the back propagation part, the feeling how the change should work out, that is uh, really done in a physical manner here. Okay, so that's a very interesting approach, but everything rests on equilibration. And so equilibration can, can be slow um, and sometimes can also get stuck in some uh, minima. Okay, so now let me jump then to the new approach that I want to sell to you, which is um, able to also produce physical parameter update. And in addition, it will be, as you will see, uh, very well suited, hopefully, for nonlinear optics platforms. And so the name we gave to this approach is Hamiltonian echo back propagation. And you will learn why it's called like this in a moment. So the goal is just the same goal as we always have. So we want to set up a cost function that measures the deviation between the um, actual output of the neural network and the desired target output. For example, just the square deviation, that's a typical choice. And we want to minimize this cost function by gradient descent, moving down the hill towards the minimum of the cost function. So, so far so good. This is the standard concept uh, behind any neural network. Now, the question we have here is, how would we access this gradient of the cost function efficiently? and also then apply the update physically. So the update that means moving the parameters in the direction of the gradient. And so the setting that we need, I claim, is rather general. Namely, you take basically any physical system that is described by a Hamiltonian. And the only constraint on the Hamiltonian is it should be time reversal invariant. So you shouldn't have a magnetic field. And you also, in particular, you shouldn't have any very significant dissipation. But other than that, just take any Hamiltonian system. There is one extra ingredient that you will need, and we will understand why that is. Uh, that is, you need to be able to apply a time reversal operation. So you need to be able to, say, flip the momenta in a mechanical setting, which is actually hard or uh, you need to be able to phase conjugate your waves if you are talking about wave propagation. And of course, people know how to do that. And so that's why waves are a promising platform for this. So time reversal invariant Hamiltonian and a time reversal operation to actually time reverse um, 
to institute a time reversal at any given time. Okay, and now I'm going to go through the main conceptual steps of the scheme, and then I'll try to explain to you why this works. And then I'll give an ex example to clarify it from yet another angle, and then uh, we will discuss it further. So uh, I have my time axis here. Um, the first uh, part uh, of the evolution is just the forward evolution. So your input signal comes in, imagine a wave packet go going into your nonlinear device, it propagates, it does something complex, it uh, yields some output, so, so far so good. Uh, and then you need to apply a time reversal operation to your output. So for waves, that would, would mean phase conjugation of the waves. And what this then means is that the waves will propagate backward through your device, and we call that the echo phase. So that would be the backward echo phase. And you can already start to see that this has some similarity uh, to backpropagation, to the mathematical procedure of backpropagation. Now, this alone would be a little bit boring because um, you would just completely undo the forward evolution if you go for this uh, in a time reversal invariant system, you would just end up with the beginning state. So what you want to do in addition is you somehow have to give information of uh, where you want it to go to. So what is your desired output? And so uh, what you need to do is before you actually go through this backward echo phase where everything just evolves backwards, you need to inject what is typically called an error signal in um, neural network language, which um, is taking the derivative of the cost function with respect to the output. But it turns out in simple cases, uh, this is just the difference between target and output. Okay. And so um, my claim here is, so I'll jump right to the uh, consequence that this has, the uh, ultimate effect, is that if you do it like this and you have your time reversal invariant Hamiltonian, um, the result is that the uh, learnable parameters theta, which just are a dynamical degree of freedom like any other, will change and they will change in just the right way. Namely, they will change along the negative gradient of the cost function. So that is quite amazing because it doesn't rely on any small details of anything. Um, that's simply what happens due to the physical dynamics. So this is, so to speak, the overview. Uh, at this point, you cannot get understand why this would happen. And um, now I want to very briefly go a little bit through the math behind it. Um, we're talking about um, dynamical degrees of freedom that might be fields or many different degrees of freedom. And uh, there are two uh, pieces. There, there is theta, the learnable parameters, and psi, the signal field. But they are both part of the dynamical degrees of freedom uh, that uh, can evolve. I will now, uh, for brevity, just uh, combine them into some field capital phi. Um, and uh, if I talk about complex fields, that allows me to very uh, compactly write down the time reversal operation. So uh, if you're from optics, this doesn't surprise you. Time reversal here just means taking the complex conjugation of the field. And time reversal invariance of my Hamiltonian just means that the evolution after the time reversal operation is just the time reversed echo of the forward evolution that I had initially. So it's just the complex conjugate of the forward evolution uh, evaluated at minus t, so running the movie backwards. So that is true, no matter how nonlinear and complicated the dynamics is. What we need, however, is somehow access to this um, gradient of the cost function. And uh, what that means in principle is we would need to figure out what would happen to our forward evolution if we perturb it slightly, if we perturb it slightly by slightly changing these learnable parameters. So that would be in the spirit of this parameter shift method that I indicated is so inefficient in, in the beginning of my talk. Yes, you want to see what would happen if my learnable parameters are slightly different. 
Now, perturbing the forward evolution of a complicated nonlinear system, well, that's just mathematically speaking, looking at the Green's function. Yeah? So this is the Green's function. And the type of Green's function we need is written down here. Actually, we need the complex conjugate of this Green's function if we look carefully into the mathematics. Now, this is something I claim we cannot easily have physical access to unless we do this very naive and inefficient method that I mentioned in the beginning. However, what we then realize is because we have this time reversal operation and the echo back propagation at our uh, disposal is what we have accessible, what we have access to is uh, perturbed backward evolution. So we can ask what happens if I inject a small perturbation uh, on top of my complicated nonlinearly a backward evolving field. Yeah, so that would be again a Green's function, but evaluated uh, for linearization around the backward evolution. And it turns out they are related due to time reversal invariance. And because they are related, they are both related due to time reversal invariance. What happens if I inject my small weak error signal on top of everything is that I'm evolving it according to this. Uh, Green's function um, that describes the backward evolution, and that then translates into what I really would have needed in the beginning, namely the perturbed forward evolution. And the result is really what I showed, that if you go through the math, um, you exactly move into the right direction. So the learnable parameters uh, go into the direction of the negative gradient of the cost function. And that's completely general. Yeah. So I'm just having a, a time reversal invariant Hamiltonian system uh, no assumptions about the complexity of the nonlinear dynamics or anything uh, that will simply happen because of physically, because of the interaction between the signal field psi and the learnable parameters uh, theta, because they are both dynamical degrees of freedom. Okay. Now, if this all sounds a little bit mysterious to you, um, I want to, I want to give you a feeling of what are the different steps and how it might be plausible that what I just described to you would really happen. And so that is the so-called, <laughs> it's a kind of cartoon version of, uh, but it already includes everything. And I like to call it the self-learning pinball machine. So this is my pinball machine. It's a mechanical system. It only has two degrees of freedom represented by these two balls, uh, red and purple. So the red ball, is really standing for the learnable parameters. It can slide along this rail so it can move to different positions. So it's somehow part of the machine. And if it changes, then the machine changes. Uh, the purple ball, however, represents the signal. So that's what I want to process here. When it comes in, in the beginning, it represents the input and then it will move through the device and then it will become the output. Now, um, so please tell me if there's any question. Um, so now uh, I want to imagine that the input is encoded, for example, in the position of this purple ball, and then I launch it through the device. Uh, it will be deflected slightly by the red ball. Maybe both of them are positively charged. So there are Coulomb forces. Um, and what will happen then is that we end up in this situation. So a uh, purple ball ends up at some spot at the output red ball uh, ends up moving along this rail. So remember, there is no dissipation. It's a, a time reversal invariant Hamiltonian. And that would be the situation. Now I could at this point implement my time reversal operation. And for a mechanical system, this simply means uh, flipping the velocities. So if I only do this, then all the movie will run backwards and I will simply end up where I started at. Yeah? So that is a little bit boring, possibly. Um, but I already told you that this is not exactly what I want to do. I also want to encode um, my desired output. So I observed, for example, this purple ball did not quite end up at the location that I wanted it to end up uh, for the input location. Um, and I want to therefore perturb it to move us a little bit uh, towards the right direction. So if I do that and then do the time reversal, what will happen is that it will not quite follow the initial trajectory backwards, but it will have been perturbed. And because that is so, also the force kick that it now exerts onto the red ball will have been slightly different. And because that is slightly different, the red ball will end up at a slightly different location than it started out at in the beginning. And it turns out that the 
way it moves really implements the um, gradient of the cost function. So it means that if I now send through the next purple ball in order to process information and to see whether my sh machine has changed in just the right manner, then indeed it will end up in a slightly different location, slightly closer to the desired output. So that's a simple mechanical analog. Of course, I'm not suggesting anyone build this because in mechanics, um, it's hard to get rid of dissipation and um, also it would be a little bit hard to do the time reversal in an easy manner. But in any case, dynamics was changed in the right way. We have been learning and it would also work for a much more complicated device. For example, if we had an arbitrary potential, so the trajectories are much more complicated then still um, it would work in the same way because it's still time reversal invariant. Okay. So now that was a mechanical example, just to explain the different pieces of what's going on. Now, um, if you want to go and implement this, uh, it's much more promising, of course, to go towards wave fields, nonlinear wave fields, in particular, nonlinear optical fields. And so the way to imagine things there is uh, depicted here in the space-time diagram. So again, this is my wave field, only the signal field is depicted. Um, it evolves in a nonlinear fashion. So there's dispersion and very complicated dynamics going on. But at some point I will implement my time reversal operation. So my phase conjugation. And if everything goes right, it would uh, then just mean the movie running backwards, the wave uh, converging again. Um, but in addition, of course, I want to inject my error signal that encodes how far away am I from my desired output. And if I do that, it turns out that um, this will launch a small extra wave on top of everything. That's what I encoded in this Green's function. And this will um, have just the right effect when acting, when interacting uh, with the learning parameters theta, with the learning field theta. So uh, to make this really more concrete, um, what we imagine in the end is not uh, really to have the learning parameters theta sitting inside the device. This is something you could think of if they were static, if they were just encoded, say, in the choice of beam splitter parameters. But we want theta to also be a wave field so it can really change dynamically. And the best way to treat it is to have both psi, the signal field, and theta, the learning field, uh, be wave fields that are injected uh, at the input of the device. And then they will interact inside the nonlinear core of the device by say, Kerr interactions. And then they will both emerge uh, out from the device and they will have both changed and I can uh, time reverse both of them at the output and send them back through the device again. So the way this really is supposed to work is depicted here again in a space time diagram. So you would have theta and psi both coming in as wave packets, both going through your nonlinear device, both being time reversed, and you inject the error signal at that point, both going back through the device. And only now there will be an important uh, difference between theta and psi because the psi field I just let go because I want to replace it by the next training sample coming in. Whereas theta, the learning parameters, of course, I want to keep, they should be living forever, so to speak. And so I will time reverse them again. And so they will move through the device again, move back out, move through the device again, and so on, and will be slowly but surely updated and changed um, during the course of this evolution. And so that's the learning process. Okay. So now, uh, whenever you invent something new, there are some precursors. And I want to compare against the two uh, proposals that are closest to our work. So there's the absolutely pioneering work of Psaltis, Dima Psaltis, Dimitri Psaltis and uh, sorry, collaborators from the 1980s already, which demonstrated some kind of self-learning in nonlinear optics, um, including some physical means of backpropagation. However, what they needed was a very careful uh, calibration of the internals of the device, so as to make sure that the transmission characteristics for each um, element would uh, be of some sort in the forward uh, propagation path and in a stand in a tight relation to that uh, for the backward propagation. So it had to be engineered that the backward transmission would be of a certain shape. Um, 
There's a more recent work by the group of Shanhui Fan where they did uh, implement general physical backpropagation, but they did not uh, find any way to do a physical update of the, uh, of the learning parameters. And so what uh, I presented to you here would have both physical backpropagation and a physical learning update, and it would be completely Hamiltonian independent, so you don't need to engineer anything. In fact, you don't need even access in principle to the nonlinear core of your device. It could be, for all you know, a black box it just needs to be a time reversal invariant Hamiltonian. And so in that sense, it's also agnostic of the physics platform, even though there may be some platforms that are more suitable than others. And so then let me um, go further and show you some first numerical examples. So these uh, do not yet attempt to completely simulate some uh, realistic physics platform in every detail, but show that the concept is sound uh, and uh, that one could take this further and really implement it in experiments. So here's a first um, example where we studied the evolution of nonlinear, coupled nonlinear wave fields, so psi and uh, theta interacting with them, some cross Kerr interaction between the wave fields. Um, and we wanted to learn a very simple function, which however is already complicated enough that for a single layer, neural network, you wouldn't be able to learn that. And that is the exclusive OR function. And so the uh, input would be encoded in two wave packets and the positions of these uh, wave packets would uh, indicate whether it's zero or one. And then you want uh, to have the output intensity either in the upper slot or in the lower slot. And that would be interpreted as being one or zero. And hopefully you, after some training, you'll get the right um, answers. Now here's what's going on. Here's what's going on in the simulation. Uh, what I'm showing here is the change in the learning field theta as time progresses. And what you can see here is the two wave packets in the Psi field propagating from left to right and already by the interaction, by the physical interaction with the theta field, by the cross curve interaction, um, implementing a shift in the theta field. And so this goes on as time progresses. Then uh, we apply a time reversal operation, inject the error signal. And then time runs backwards, so to speak. And what you see if you look very closely at these pictures is that much of the initial change will be undone. That's, so to speak, the movie running backwards or the dynamics will be undone, except a tiny remaining part. And that remaining part, uh, that is really the overall learning update uh, that we need in order to get the right input output mapping. So that's what happens. Uh, that's why we need this time reversal operation. So there's first some change in the learning parameters, and then much of this change is being undone, except a small remaining change that comes from the error signal and pushes us in the right direction. OK, so how does this work? Um, this is, say, a randomly initialized learning field initially. And then as time goes on, it changes, it deforms and uh, becomes better and better in producing uh, what we really need. Now that was still a very simple example. Um, here's a more advanced example, namely image classification. So you would want to send in an image like these handwritten digits, uh, the MNIST, typical MNIST example, and the output uh, would be uh, one hot encoding, meaning that um, you would want the intensity to light up in different pieces of the picture, depending on what digit has been recognized. And again, we would uh, have these uh, nonlinear wave fields interacting with each other and apply the same procedure. And what we find is that indeed the training error goes down over time uh, as you send through more and more samples. And then you can study interesting uh, pieces of physics. For example, you can say, Oh, how do these things depend on the strength of the nonlinearity? And you find that the nonlinearity has to be of a certain strength uh, in order to get uh, sufficient learning success. Okay, and so in the in the last three minutes or so of the talk, uh, let me say something about possible experimental platforms. Now, first. I have a little list of requirements and challenges. So this is now a very, what we think is a very general uh, scheme for training learning machines. In fact, it's the only general scheme we know of apart from this equilibrium uh, 
propagation that uh, works in a completely different re regime of thermalizing systems. What you need is definitely some nonlinearity. What you also need is low loss, because remember, we want time reversal invariant Hamiltonian, so ideally uh, zero loss. If there is a little bit of loss, we can cope with that by re-amplifying the signal in principle. We also need some time reversal operation and some other detail that I skipped a little bit, but it just requires similar ingredients as the time reversal operation. So that is why uh, having wave fields where people know how to use nonlinear optics in order to do phase conjugation is promising. Uh, there can, of course, be there could be noise or non-ideality in these operations and the time reversal. But uh, since this time reversal operation can happen outside the nonlinear core, uh, you could calibrate it. And so it's fairly robust. And we did simulations on that. And then um, finally, of course, once you did your training and thousands of iterations, eventually you also want to have some long-term storage of the learning field. So presumably you would want to read it out in some fashion and then keep it in a permanent fashion. Okay, so what are promising platforms? So uh, one promising platform is nonlinear optics in general. And an example would be to do uh, integrated photonics. So you would have waveguides and maybe uh, resonators to enhance the nonlinearities. And the details of this setup are really not important because as I told you, in principle, you can take any nonlinear complicated uh, device and train it. Um, you could uh, implement these nonlinearities in various fashions and certain micro resonators, photonic crystal defect cavities. Maybe you uh, could even use other nonlinearities such as the interaction between light and mechanical motion. Um, these are all possibilities. Um, if you want to move beyond nonlinear optics, um, at least for uh, proof of principle experiments, we feel also superconducting circuits are very promising because they uh, offer very strong nonlinearities and uh, for the purposes of quantum computing, they have been optimized very much uh, to uh, decrease the amount of loss that you have. And then there are various other possibilities, maybe spin waves or nonlinear matter waves. So whenever you have some kinds of waves that are nonlinear and where you think you can keep the dissipation low and where you think you can uh, implement a time reversal operation, then you may be in business. And so uh, currently uh, we are really exploring this kind of platform, integrated photonics platform. Okay, so um, with that, I'm uh, really finished. Uh, what I have tried to show you is a really general scheme uh, to train um, self-learning physics machines which we called Hamiltonian echo back propagation. By now you understand why it's called like that. And we claim that this is Hamiltonian independent. So it's very platform agnostic and you could use it for many different platforms to do both physical back propagation and physical parameter update. And um, yeah, so I'm looking forward to any discussions, especially uh, also with people who think they might have a experimental platform where this could be implemented. Thank you very much. Please. Yeah, thank you, Florian, for this really inspiring talk. Um, I, I was wondering first how you would generate the, the error signal and whether it's scaled or whether it's just a difference or whether you want just a portion of it to be back in check. Uh, yes, okay. So this error signal in principle depends on the cost function, but if the cost function is quadratic, um, it's really in principle... In principle, it's just the difference, but uh, I don't know whether I find it now, but uh, what we um, what we imagine is simply in an optical platform that you just inject a weak version, that you superimpose a weak version of the desired output, let's say on a beam splitter um, onto, your, onto your signal, and that would be injecting the error signal. And does that have to be strong enough to reduce the non-parity? Ah, no. So that's that's the no. That's the funny thing, yeah. So um, there is the nonlinear in the non-linearity in the information processing, 
but uh, all this injecting the error signal and updating the parameters, all that is, so to speak, linearized dynamics on top of the strong nonlinear dynamics that was there in the forward propagation, if you know what I mean. So the error signal in principle can be infinitesimally weak. Now, of course, uh, you still don't want to do it infinitesimally weak. And first, the reason is, of course, if it's really weak, then there will be almost no change and you will wait forever for the training. Uh, but also there could be small non-idealities, some little bit of noise. And so at least the error signal should over this extra little error signal should overwhelm this noise. And so that's why, in fact, we find there is some kind of, if there is some noise, then there is a sweet spot where your error signal is just large enough to overwhelm the noise, but not so large that you already reach the nonlinear uh, regime because that you want to avoid, at least all the mathematics relies on this being a linear perturbation on, on top of a strong nonlinear background. I hope that made sense. Uh, just to continue about this, uh, this question, uh, the injected error signal is based on the target minus the output. So if you know the target, isn't this a uh, supervised learning instead of, uh, instead of self-learning? And uh, what is the difference between self-learning and supervised learning? if you are giving the targets to, to the learning. Uh, you... Okay, so I should have made that clearer. Thank you for the important question. So everything I've been talking about is supervised learning. Yeah, uh, the okay. self-learning refers to the way the supervised learning is implemented. So instead of coming in with a feedback loop or some external computer that processes anything or you going in and changing the internal parameters of the device, everything is done by autonomous physical dynamics. So the only way, the only, the only part you're uh, coming in from the outside is of course to inject the desired output because I mean, you have to tell, uh, right? The device cannot know on its own, um, but everything else is by autonomous physical dynamics. So self-learning is here used not in the sense of unsupervised learning like um, unsupervised uh, clustering or anything like that, uh, but it's used in the sense of purely autonomous physical dynamics. So both the backpropagation part and the parameter update, they are, done, they are produced by the Hamiltonian dynamics of the device. So that's how I uh, want the term self-learning to be understood here. But definitely in the computer science language, this is all supervised learning. So we have training examples that have an input and a corresponding output. And this is a physical way to, to learn from them. Thank you for your talk. I was wondering in optics, do you have time reversal symmetry per definition or might you destroy this by the nonlinearities? Um, so the nonlinearities should not destroy that. I can have a current nonlinearity. There I have time reversal symmetry still intact. Uh, I just need to watch out that I don't have, say, uh, some magnetic components. So if as soon as I have circulators, Faraday isolators, and so on, they would destroy time reversal uh, invariance. So I, that I want to get rid of, but nonlinearities, I have very much, uh, very great freedom. Thank you. Okay, thanks. I think um, ah, okay, last question. Okay, last question, please. And then how much dissipation can you tolerate? That doesn't the memory sort of imply some dissipation as well? Uh, the memory, okay. So first of all, um, we want the dissipation to be as low as possible. Um, I said we can tolerate a little bit if the say nonlinear dynamics is not appreciably affected. Um, say we have a forward pass, we have a little bit of dissipation in this forward pass, then we have a echo signal that is slightly reduced and if the nonlinear dynamics of that um, backward pass is still approximately equal to what it would have been in the completely dissipation-free case, then we are still fine because we can still amplify. We imagine we amplify uh, the learning parameters after this pass. Um, we're, we're doing simulations on that. So um, I cannot give you complete 
so that ex exact numbers would depend very much on the architecture um, that you look at, but we, we feel it's um, plausible in this uh, integrated photonics platform uh, where we have these, um, where we have say nonlinear micro resonators. Okay, thanks uh, Florian, thank you again. Thank you. So we have the yeah, later, so we have the coffee break as usual. And we do also have uh, the lunch today, at 12.30 as usual. And uh, so, but no further talks. Uh, so we thought we could uh, uh, spend about half an hour uh, for the coffee break and then uh, meet again here, let's say at 11.45. We can use uh, some of this time for uh, um, interaction, especially with students, to, to hear uh, suggestions, feedback, uh, comments, criticism. And uh, so I also I want to mentioned that it's very likely that uh, this school will uh, take place again in two years. So not next year, the program is already filled, but uh, uh, we have, uh, it's uh, already the second edition of this school uh, that took place uh, last year online. And uh, I think it's a good opportunity, of course, uh, changing somehow the speakers and teams uh, to, to continue this tradition. That's why your feedback uh, will be very important for uh, future students. Okay, so thank you. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. 